Today's speaker is Atalia Omer. Uh, her title is Jerusalem's Future, Peace or Apocalypse? Professor Omer is an Associate Professor of Religion, Conflict and Peace Studies at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at Notre Dame. Her PhD came from Harvard from their Committee on the Study of Religion and her work has been a, a sustained study of the interrelation between religion and nationalism. She explores religion and nationalism and peace building, the role of national, religious, and ethnic diasporas in the dynamics of conflict transformation and peace, about how multiculturalism can be a framework for conflict transformation and as a theory of justice. Her first book, derived from her thesis, is called When Peace is Not Enough, with the subtitle, How the Israeli Peace Camp Thinks About Religion, Nationalism, and Justice. And it was published by the University of Chicago Press last year. It examines the way in which the Israeli peace camp addresses interrelationships between religion, ethnicity, and nationality. Little did either of us know when we uh, agreed that she would do this opening lecture in the series uh, that we would be yet again plunged into a crisis uh, over Gaza uh, and that this would be uh, a more timely lecture than we could have otherwise anticipated. But in spite of its timeliness, or because of its timeliness, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce to you Atalia Elmer. Thank you. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for coming. And uh, I should say that there was a question mark uh, in the original title of my talk, Peace or Apocalypse? A question mark, not any kind of um, an assertion. Uh, and somehow it was omitted. <laughs> uh, so um, I don't know what to think about that, about this omission. So again, thank you for coming here um, to, uh, today. So this talk will highlight the deep meanings the city of Jerusalem occupies in the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim imaginations. I will also highlight the need to analyze and understand the sacredness of the city within its geopolitical and historical context, and therefore reflect on the presumption of indivisibility of sacred space. We will ask whether the debate over Jerusalem is essentially political, theological, what might be the relations between the two types of claims and entitlements, what are the implications of these debates to the possibility of peace with justice? The, the structure of this talk is as follows. I begin with a brief ex exposition of theological claims of the three Abrahamic traditions to the city of Jerusalem, and I proceed uh, by introducing the limitations of thinking about the city as it relates to the contemporary Israeli-Palestinian conflict only through the prism of theological or religious claims. Here I will have to fast forward just a few millennia uh, to the declining years of the Ottoman Empire and the entry of, to the region of British and other Western colonialists. From there we will ask why Jerusalem can be analyzed as a microcosm of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. A crucial scholarly question that animates my work as a cultural sociologist of religion at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies revolves around the connections between religion, conflict, and peace building. Uh, from my perspective, carefully analyzing how religion relates to the unfolding of various forms of violence, direct, systemic, or structural, cultural, and symbolic, can also give us ideas and tools to think about the constructive role of religion in processes of peace building and conflict transformation. In discussing the city of Jerusalem, in particular, it is important to engage and scrutinize the meanings of sacred spaces. Are there, are there scope, geographically speaking, fixed or dynamic, and how is that determined? And who makes this determination? It is also important to reflect on the complex connections between religion and the production and reproduction of national and political claims. All right, so one question to, to begin with is where is Jerusalem? Is it, as this iconic representation suggests, at the center of the world? If not literally, then why is it depicted as such metaphorically? What, in any case, is the relation between the literal and metaphorical Jerusalem? 
Is the real sacred Jerusalem a heavenly city and one antithetical to the earthly Jerusalem? Or <clears throat> is Jerusalem the corpus separatum prescribed by UN Resolution 181 for the partition of mandatory Palestine in 1947? This map of Jerusalem includes Bethlehem, which nowadays is excluded from most maps of the city that are gerrymandered differently. These are just a sample of maps and representations to stress the elasticity of the very question, where is Jerusalem? For most of its history, it was one square kilometer contained within the walls of the old city. I will return to this question shortly, but will now transition to discuss in great speed the complex theological claims to the city. The speed in which I proceed will unfortunately do injustice to all these complex claims. The intention is just to give you a, a taste before returning to the complex question concerning the politics of sacred space. So this, the city of Jerusalem has constituted a symbol of peace. Its very name is in Hebrew, Yerushalayim, contains the root shalom, meaning wholeness and peace. The city has also been a focus of, and the site of apocalyptic imaginations and messianic passions, a place where various end time scenarios unfold. It is believed to be the site of the resurrection of the dead in all three Abrahamic tradition. All right, so the purchase of the cave near Hebron, uh, the cave that came to be known as the Tomb of the Patriarchs, <clears throat> uh, it's a purchase by Abraham from Ephron the Hittite, and it's dated to around 19th century BCE, before the Common Era. The purchase of the cave of the Machpelah and surrounding field near Kiryat Arba, or Hebron, as burial ground for Sarah and, fem and a family plot is mentioned explicitly in the biblical source. An ownership of burial land was considered at the time a crucial step in establishing legal residence. The Genesis verse reads as follows, quote, Abraham rose up from beside his dead and said to the Hittites, I'm a stranger and an alien residing among you. Give me property among you for a burying place so that I may bury my dead out of my sight. If you are willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me Ephron son of Zohar so that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, the tomb of the patriarch, which he owns for the full price. Let him give it to me in your presence as a, as a possession for a burying place. Behind a rather modest effort to complete a legal transaction of property, there are a few explicit and highly familiar biblical passages that convey a divine promise to Abraham and his descendants. So Genesis 15, 18 to 21 offers one example. Quote, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying to your descendants, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river uh, Euphrates, the land of the Kenite, the Kenazites, the Jebusite, etc., etc., etc. So from legal transaction, transaction to a divine promise. <clears throat> Fast forward to the time of Joshua and the entry to the land of Canaan after escaping slavery in Egypt, which is the story of the Exodus and the reception of the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, we may detect a tone that recognizes that the divine promise to one group means that another group is experiencing dispossession, to say the least. The book of Joshua 24:13 reads as follows, quote, I gave you a land on which you had not labored and cities which you had not built and you dwelt therein. You eat the fruit of vineyards and olive yards which you did not plant, end of quote. It is, however, important to note that the biblical text, like other sacred sources, are filled with competing motives of universality and particularity, ownership and destiny being, of being sojourners as evident in Deuteronomy 16.20, justice and only justice you shall follow, that you may live and inherit the land which the Lord your God gives you. Fast forward again, now to the Davidic monarchy, during which Jerusalem's centrality to the Israelites and later the Jews was consolidated. Okay, so under King David, around 1000 before the Common Era, the Philistines are pushed out and a kingdom is established, including Transjordan and Lebanon, Moab, Ammon, Edom, and Aram. It was during the Davidic period that the scriptural, theological conceptualization of promise of the land was developed. <clears throat> it is during this period 
that Jerusalem becomes a center and a capital of the kingdom. The reasons behind that are also political, since it was a neutral space, not in possession of any of the 12 Hebraic tribes. There was also a water source, as well as the strategic benefit of the high altitude of the city. King David shortly com com combines Jerusalem's political centrality with the religious one by preparing a space for the Ark of the Covenant on the side of the foundation stone, believed to be the site where the original Jebusite god was worshipped, the almost and also the site of the almost sacrifice of Isaac by Abraham, the creation of Adam, the creation, the creation of the world, and, the, and therefore probably the nearest place on earth to God. It's the holiest of holy. In the terminology of sacred space, this is an axis mundi. However, King David doesn't get to build a temple because he has too much blood on his hand. So, and, uh, so the, uh, this is um, a picture of the foundation stone, now at the center of what is known as the Dome of the Rock, one of the most known and recognizable Islamic structures. But we will get to this chapter in Jerusalem's history shortly. So King Solomon <clears throat> builds the second temple. He is the son of David. The temple was constructed on the Temple Mount, known uh, in Hebrew as Harabait, or Mount of Zion, Zion being one of the many Hebrew names of Jerusalem, or Haramuria, which is uh, uh, Mount Moriah, the, the name uh, of the place that is associated with the, um, uh, with, uh, the binding of Isaac. Muslims refer to it as the Haram al-Sharif. It was during the Davidic period that messianic motifs developed, indicating that the Messiah will be a descendant of the, of, of the, of the King David, of family or bloodline, uh, who will lead the world to universal peace and prosperity, a time that will see the building of the third temple and the resurrection of the dead. Therefore, we have here Mount of Olives overlooking that site of the foundation stone. It has been a highly desired piece of cemetery uh, just by virtue of its closeness to the end time action. Many Jews from millennia will make a journey to Jerusalem in order to be buried there. After a, a succession of empires and the destruction of, the, of an exile of the 10 northern tribes of the divided Israelite kingdom by the Assyrians, we now move we move to the destruction of the, of the first temple and the subsequent Babylonian exile of the Judean elite under King Nebuchadnezzar. This is 586 BCE, before the Common Era. This is a crucial chapter in the history because it was during this time that a distinct Jewish identity began to develop outside the temple cult, a rather unusual development for the ancient Near East. Okay, things got better fairly soon under the Persians. We have King Cyrus of Persia who allowed Jews to return from exile to rebuild the temple. This is the second temple period. Later, Herod the Great um, of the Roman Empire doubled the size to about 36 acres. Uh, this is what, what we see here. A famous uh, chapter of the Second Temple era is, of course, that of Hanukkah that commemorates the re rededication of the temple after it was appropriated by Syrian Greek soldiers as a temple to the worship of the god um, uh, Zeus in 168 BCE. At the time of the, the Syrian Greek emperor Antiochus outlawed Jewish practice, but resistance emerged from a place called Modi'in near Jerusalem and a place where there is now a settlement, a Jewish settlement. The rebels are known as the, as the Maccabees, and their militant resistance is celebrated today as a paradigm of national resistance. The second temple, however, was finally destroyed in the year 70, um, uh, 70 of the Common Era, and the Jews were forbidden entry to the city of Jerusalem after a series of revolts against the Roman authorities. These revolts, such as the Bar Kokhba revolt or the Masada siege, are celebrated as crucial landmarks in the production and reproduction of Israeli nationalism and militarism. Interestingly, though, for most of, the, of Jewish history, these events were downplayed as disastrous chapters in Jewish history. They were considered disastrous by the rabbis for whom martyrdom was marked by endurance and the constant study of Torah despite the constant threat of persecutions. What the 19th century secular European movement called Zionism or Jewish nationalism did was to subvert traditional understanding of Jewish history. Just to clarify, 
Modern Jewish nationalism is called Zionism because Zion is, again, one of the names of Jerusalem. And by extension, the entire landscape of now Israel and Palestine is referred to as Zion as well. The subversion of traditional understanding of the theological and messianic concepts of return to, the, to and the ingathering of exiles in the land is profoundly related to the growing traction of nationalist ideologies in Europe of the 19th century, as well as to the growing and new forms of anti-Semitism Jews face there, um, and processes of, uh, as well as processes of secularism that informed reframing Jewish identity as ethnic, national, cultural, and historical, rather than religious per se. However, the transvaluation of values associated with secular Zionism or secular Jewish nationalism had to draw selectively on the resources of tradition, including their, um, uh, their concrete manifestations such as the, uh, the Western Wall, which is here. So the Western Wall is the only remaining wall of the Herodian structure. In fact, it was the Western sup uh, support wall built during the Her Herodian expansion of the mount. This wall became a special locus of prayer and pilgrimage and longing because its proximity to the holiest of holies that we discussed earlier. The mention of the two temples and their destruction is very crucial to our understanding of contemporary national claims. Since the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948, the authorities were very intentional in their pursuit of biblical archaeology and the construction of museums and other national monuments and sites of national pilgrimages surrounding their uncovering of biblical proofs of physical presence in the land. The, the Western Wall, or the Kotel, as it call, it's called in Hebrew, uh, for instance, is the site of military induction ceremonies. Beginning with the first Babylonian exile, we see the emergence of rabbinic authorities and a move away from the temple as the essence and center of Jewish life. This move happened while still retaining the profound longing and yearning to return for millennia. Jews express three times a day during the Amidah prayer their desire to return to Jerusalem. And twice a day, uh, twice a year in the Passover Seder and the Day of Atonement, they recite next year in Jerusalem. But the return, especially with the second destruction, became projected to some time in an idealized future, in meta-historical rather than historical time, time that will signal the messianic moment. Therefore, the emergence of the rabbis, meaning simply teachers of the Torah, de-intensified the apocalyptic sentiments that were quite prevalent at the time of the Roman destruction. At this point, it is important to note that the already mentioned movement of secular Zionism of the 19th century Europe challenged and subverted profoundly traditional Jewish understanding about the notion of return to the land of Zion. Traditional religious Jews in Europe opposed the nationalistic movement on a theological grounds precisely because Zionism viewed itself as a human-initiated rather than divine-initiated movement for the physical redemption of Jews who at the time suffered from increasing levels of anti-Semitism, including occasional and devastating pogroms. For most of the, of the millennia of Jewish history in the diasporas, Jews longed to return to Jerusalem, but they could not hasten the messianic moment and attempt to return en masse. Such attempts were labeled as false messianism. This is where it is insightful to think about Zionism from a more comparative analysis of modern nationalisms and their relation to antecedent religious and cultural worldviews. Modern nationalism, all selectively retrieved from the cultural building blocks within their particular context, but there is a profound reorienting of the meaning of redemption. Nationalism offered this worldly redemption ingrained in the concept of self-determination. And yet the relation between traditions and secular nationalisms are not one of replacement, but rather much more complex and ambivalent as the case of Zionism illuminates. I will return to this point, but let us now move briefly to discuss Christian claims to Jerusalem and the Holy Land more broadly. So uh, this, is a, um, <clears throat> this verse is to offer an example of the development of supersessionist interpretation of Judaism from a Christian perspective and with a supersessionist interpretation of the earthly Jerusalem significance. <clears throat> In early Christianity, and by the way, there are crucial overlaps and similarities between early Christian literature 
and the, and the late Second Temple Jewish apocryphal literature. At this time, we see the universalization and spiritualization of the city and the temple, the, uh, the concept of peoplehood and the land. By supersessionary, I mean that the Christian church is gradually interpreted to be the new elect, and an understanding of the heavenly Jerusalem replaces the material city as a focus of aspiration and longing. What we see in this early literature of around 200 of the Common Era is a high level of influence of Hellenistic motifs and frequent alleg allegorizing of territorial realities. Here we see the beginning of a development of Jerusalem as a metaphor or heavenly peace rather than territory. The spiritualization of the city, however, was never absolute and um, and crucial tensions exist between the material and ideal meanings of the city. The role of Helena Augusta, Constantine's, the great Constantine's emperor's mother, illuminates this point. Constantine enters the picture and his famous conversion to Christianity in three, uh, uh, 306 constitutes a crucial chapter in the long history of the city of Jerusalem, now called Elia Capitolina. Christianity becomes an imperial re religion and the period known as Pax Romana is associated with this development. In this context, an interest in the actual earthly Jer Jerusalem is gaining momentum with a building program and archeological excavations led by Elena Augusta that uh, purportedly identifies the site of the crucifixion of Jesus and traces Jesus' steps across the land and marks those locations with churches and shrines. She is considered the first Christian pilgrim to Elia Capitolina at around 326 of the Common Era. During this, those initial Christian centuries of the city of Jews were not allowed in. So this is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre or the Church of the Resurrection. The location of the church is believed to be the place where Jesus was crucified and it also believed to be the site of Jesus' burial and resurrection. Constantine ordered the building of the church to replace a temple dedicated to the Roman goddess Venus, constructed under the command of the Roman emperor Hadrian in the, uh, toward the end of the second century. The story is that in the course of building the church, Helena discovered the true cross and the tomb, as well as many other stations de uh, designating Jesus' journey in Jerusalem, all of which have been destinations for Christian pilgrims ever since. The first Christian era of the city, the Byzantine period, ended with the entry of the Muslims in the seventh century. Before returning to a sampling of relevant Christian perspective, let us now turn briefly to discuss the Quranic basis for Muslim claims to be dis distinguished, as I will shortly, uh, shortly demonstrate, from other types of claims that Muslim inhabitants of the land might have. All right, so this verse from Surah 2 illuminates that Islam is also a supersessionist tradition. It recognizes the authenticity of Judaism and Christianity, but believes that Muhammad is the seal of the prophets and that Abraham was the first Muslim who, together with Ishmael, eradicated idolatry and established the monotheistic cult of the Kaaba in Mecca. And this is the Kaaba. The Kaaba is the holiest place in Islam. It is a large cube-shaped building inside Al-Masjid Al-Haram Mosque in, Me in Mecca. The, uh, Mecca, which is the birthplace of the prophet and the site of his initial revelations. Jerusalem, or as it's known, Al-Quds, the Holy One, is the third holiest site for Muslims. So Islam supersedes the claims to Jerusalem by establishing a prior relationship of Abraham to Mecca, declaring that Muslims should turn to Mecca, not to Jerusalem to pray. But in terms of direct theological claims to the city, here is what is most relevant. Surah 17.1 describes the Prophet's night journey, or Al-Isra, uh, 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 in the following way. Quote, limitless in his glory is he who transported his servant by night from the inviolable house, Al-Masjid Al-Haram, al of worship at Mecca, so the Kaaba, to the remote house of worship at Jerusalem, the environs of which we had blessed so that we might show him some of our symbols, for he alone is all hearing, all seeing." End of quote. After arriving to the remote house of worship, and the, and the word used here is Al-Aqsa Mosque, the farthest away mosque, 
the Prophet, accord, according to the Quranic text, experiences a mirage or an ascent to heaven in which he encounters all the prior prophets. The site of the Isra and mirage is the same stone at the foundation of the Jewish temple. This, this is Burak, the winged horse that facilitated the night journey of the Prophet. Um, it's through details of the tradition of, or hadith that we know that Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa or the farthest mosque was the same place that the Jews called the Temple Mount. Mount. The journey to Jerusalem established the supersessionist connection of Islam to the two older traditions. His ascension involved, according to tradition, meeting all the prophets that came before him and establishing Muhammad as the seal of the prophets. There is also the added meaning that the foundation stone, once again, is the axis mundi and the closest place on earth to heaven. In other words, there was no direct flight from Mecca to heaven. You had to make a connection in Jerusalem. The day of judgment within the Muslim context also will be a moment when all the faithful will be brought to Jerusalem and the Kaaba will be transported as well. So uh, this is the Dome of the Rock, which is located in the center of the Temple Mount, exactly on the location where the second temple once stood and is next to the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Both structures are referred to collectively as the Haram al-Sharif. In the year 637, a little after the death of the, of the Prophet Muhammad, Muslim, Muslim forces entered Jerusalem. The Dome of the Rock was constructed shor shortly after under the directors of Umayyad Caliph Abdul Malik. The construction completed in 691 of the Common Era. And uh, notably, when Jerusalem was initially captured by Caliph Omar, Mount Moriah, which is the, 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 uh, the site of the Dome of the Rock, was a garbage dump because during the Christian centuries, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre became the heart of the city and the main destination in it. <clears throat> Under Muslim control, Jews were allowed to return to the city and engage in their various practices as long as they paid a special dimmi tax, uh, which is the tax that the people of the, people of the book had to, to, to pay in order to be tolerated. In short, the first Muslim centuries were interrupted with the period of the Christian Crusades, starting with the capture of Jerusalem in 1099, where immediately the Augustinians turned the Dome of the Rock into a church. This is the story of Jerusalem. Churches converted into mosques, mosques converted into churches, and layers and layers of history and conflict, where sacred spaces are politicized, and political spaces and ideas are sacralized. And during the Crusader era, Jerusalem was basically emptied of Jews and Muslims, and the city was mostly depopulated. So this is Saladin. This is the, uh, Saladin, who is, was a warrior of Kurdish descent from the city of Tikrit, uh, of nowadays Iraq. He conquered the city of Jerusalem back from the Christian crusading forces in 1887, and today is celebrated as an iconic representation of liberation from what is perceived from the perspective of Palestinians as a colonial invasion and, and, and control. Saladin allowed Jews to return to the city. Well, for most of its history, Jerusalem was a Muslim city under various Muslim dynasties and rulers. The relatively brief Crusader period offers a symbolic template through which to interpret the contemporary moment. Jerusalem subsequently will become a Mamluk city for 600 years before shifting hands to the Ottomans. This empire will, will experience a total, a total collapse after World War I. It is important to note that during all those centuries, there were people in the land and in Jerusalem who were Muslim and Christians and some Jews, and they, they carry with them indigenous entitlements that are not based on theological authorizations. So, <clears throat> so far I described to you uh, some of the theological claims to the city. The assumption is one of indivisibility, uh, in, in that how can one possibly negotiate supposedly uh, ultimate, uh, the, the, the supposedly ultimate and sacred, and sacred claims. So this leads us to the second part of the presentation, which ponders why we cannot think of Jerusalem as it relates to the contemporary Israeli-Palestinian conflict only in theological terms. 
If one thinks of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and how Jerusalem relates to it only in theological or religious terms, one can easily overlook important contextual and historical details and can fall all too easily to arguments informed by the logic of the clash of civilizations. This mode of analysis essentializes religion, treating religious developments in a historical and monochromatic fashion. By essentializing, I mean treating religious traditions and the people associated with such traditions as if they were one constant essence with no internal pluralities, historical and other fluctuations. This point leads me to underscore that an analysis of Jerusalem and how it relates to the contemporary Palestinian-Israeli conflict cannot revert to such ahistorical arguments grounded merely in decontextualized and selective readings of sacred texts and other religious warrants. The contemporary conflict is highly modern, and its genesis is not with Abraham, but rather with the decline of the Ottoman Empire and the restructuring of the Middle East by the Western colonial forces who participated in World War I. One of the main problems with framing the discussion in theological terms or using the interpretive lens of ancient hatred, Jews and Muslims have been enemies since the beginning of time, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, is that it participates in a form of symbolic and cultural violence in that it overlooks claims about physical presence of the Palestinian indigenous communities in the land all this, throughout all these centuries. It also overlooks the sizable, even if diminishing, Christian Palestinian community. It is precisely on this level of discussion that Christian Palestinians argue for the need to address not only direct and obvious violence, <clears throat> as represented um, in checkpoints, targeted killing, and the practice of collective punishment, and very concretely in this image of the separation wall, but also in how Palestinian narratives are silenced and why. One target of this discussion is precisely the language of chosenness that permeates both Christian and Jewish Zionisms. Christian Zionism refers to a Christian understanding that the return of Jews to the land of Zion as per the biblical prophecy is instrumental for the unfolding of Christian end time theology. This movement that at, uh, at the time of the 19, 19th and early 20th century was also referred to as restorationism has had a wide cultural and popular appeals dating back to the Protestant Reformation, influencing various key political figures from the British Lord Balfour, who promised a Jewish home for the Jews, as if it was his to promise and grant, <clears throat> to the highly popular American Left Behind theory that sold millions of copies and fixated on the city of Jerusalem as a necessary apocalyptic destination. The left behind theory conveys what is called dis dispensationalism, a view quite prevalent within evangelical circles informing positions on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in profound ways with strong ramifications for lobbying and shaping policy decisions. The term dispensation denotes a period of biblical time and Christian Zionism can be simply summarized as the belief that the ingathering of Jews in Zion is a prerequisite for the second coming of Jesus. The critique of, of Jewish and Christian Zionism articulated by Christian Palestinians illuminates the importance of scrutinizing how various policies are authorized culturally and religiously. This is where the study of the cultural sociology of religion is important in terms of participating in both the analysis of conflict and the various claims Conflicts, invo uh, conflicts involve, and in imagining alternative arguments. In addition to the violence associated with the very language of chosenness, there are other forms of cultural violence that deeply influence the, the silencing of Palestinian narratives. This relates to what, what, what is called Orientalism, uh, which is a perception of the Orient and the Oriental is somewhat less developed and enlightened. This kind of Orientalism has allowed um, Prime Minister, uh, the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu to tweet the horrific beheading of journalist James Foley by ISIS as a proof for his own war against Hamas, his, his Muslims, um, as if they were the same. So by now I hope it is clear that breaking down the problem of the divisibility or indivisibility of Jerusalem to an engagement with respective theological arguments is insufficient, while nonetheless recognizing the importance of developing familiarity with such argument and especially with how they are authentically understood by people on the ground and other stakeholders is, 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 is also crucial. This is also a general point about the analysis of religion, conflict, and peace building. 
A study of the case of Israel-Palestine illuminates, however, a more complex causal picture and one that will need to look carefully at the history of colonialism in the region, the legacy of anti-Semitism, the logic of nationalism as reflected in the emergence of Jewish, of Jewish Zionism as a, as a thoroughly European movement. This is not to reduce the analysis of this conflict to these developments, but rather to illuminate the various contexts within which the various theological claims mentioned above are articulated and why and by whom. To just briefly give an example of the enduring colonial legacy, let us look at what happened in the Psych Pico agreement with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, a collapse that was long in the making. The Western colonial powers got together and produced this agreement to divide up the Middle East. Of course, these days, this map is being reshaped quite significantly. Um, but, uh, but a result of this uh, agreement, this map, we got what is referred to as mandatory Palestine. <clears throat> Britain got Palestine as a mandate and General Edmund Allenby entered Jerusalem, we see him here, with the British press proclaiming him the heir of Richard the Lionheart, the legendary 12th century crusader while Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister at the time, was highly influenced by re restorationism. The British mode of engagement with the various communities in the Middle East was marked by, by contradictory promises. I have already mentioned the Balfour Declaration, which concurred with the con with, um, which, which concurred with a contradictory promise to the Sharif Hussein of Mecca in return for his help with the Arab revolt against the Turk. The redrawing of boundaries on the, on the sand have profound ramifications till today, and one cannot understand the specificity of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict without studying the history of colonialism in the region, including its known policy of divide and conquer. Okay, so... Um, one that in Palestine manifested with the appointment of chiefs, rabbis, and muftis as community leaders. So on the left, uh, we have Hajamin al Husseini. He became a crucial and instrumental figure in imagining a common Palestinian or indigenous identity that transcended local and regional clan-based identification, which had characterized Palestinian society. And Jerusalem became, just like in the times of King David, pivotal in the process of generating a cross-regional national identity and opposition to the British, British and Zionist presence. The Western Wall became a site of repeated riots and violence, often in the context of marking ritualistic moments, such as the celebration of the, of the Neb Nebi Musa or the Prophet Moses' um, uh, uh, birth. Rav Cook, the, uh, the other gentleman there, became a crucial historical figure with great relevance for today because as a religious Jew, he tried to articulate a synthesis between the secular Zionist impulse for political self-determination and traditional Jewish understanding of the end time and the notion of return to the land. His son and a group of religious Zionists who became attracted to his teaching will later in the 1970s develop the ideological framing informing the settlement movement in the territories Israel occupied in 1967. So colonialism and the specific legacy of British colonialism is not the only explanatory frame. The contemporary Israeli-Palestinian conflict cannot be understood without an engagement with the legacy of anti-Semitism and the event of the Holocaust or Shoah. This is a picture of Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum located in the municipality of Jerusalem. I chose this picture in order to briefly exemplify what this national space is meant to accomplish in terms of socializing Israeli and non-Israeli Jews. The museum tells a long history of anti-Semitism, starting with classical Christian religiously based anti-Semitism and ending with the racially based one of the Nazis. Jewish history is told as a series of persecutions Visitors walk through the exhibits and finally exit onto this magnificent view of the mountains of Jerusalem. This is the Zionist narration of Jewish history. Zion or Jerusalem is the destination of Jewish history. Which, and I also refer to, to it as a Zionist teleology, with Zion as the telos or destination where Jewish life is to be fulfilled. The re redemption of the Jews in the aftermath of the Shoah, however, entails the dispossession of the indigenous Palestinian community. This is an image that on its surface seems to quite pastoral, but in effect represents a profound violence. 
instance of violence, where, where, where those pine trees once stood, there used to be, uh, uh, where, where, where those pine tre uh, trees now stand, there used to be a Palestinian village. The image of pine trees thus represents a Palestine, uh, to the Palestinians their catastrophe. <clears throat> so here's Pope Francis uh, in his recent visit to the region. I want us to think um, of the relation between the two walls. His prayer at the Western Wall is very significant and symbolic because of the legacy of classical religiously based anti-Semitism, a phenomenon with deep cultural tentacles. This wall is juxtaposed here to the separation wall or the apartheid wall as Palestinians call it. The Pope is praying there to express his solidarity with the suffering of Palestinians. Contrasting these two walls, these two images is very crucial for our effort to understand the conflict. Again, not in a simplistic manner that begins with the book of Genesis, God's covenant with Abraham, and the legal transaction related to the purchase of the tomb of the patriarchs, but one that considers how the biblical and theological claims that get selectively retrieved in the production of various national programs and how modern history from the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and Ford has informed the trajectory of this conflict. The question of who is doing all of this selective retrieval is also relevant and therefore brings to the fore the need to analyze power as it relates to the question of sacred spaces and their negotiability or non-negotiability. The tragedy of the Holocaust is deeply intertwined with the tragedy of the Palestinians called the Nakba. While the process of uh, 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 systemic dispossession began already with the Zionist immigration at the end of the 19th century, the first chapter of this tragedy, the Nakba, uh, denotes what many historians and analysts refer to as ethnic cleansing that marked what the Israelis called the War of Independence of 1948. 1948 marked the creation of the so-called Palestinian refugee problem. Many of the people who live today in Gaza are refugees from the Nakba. And I'll end here. So I think I, I will call on, we have time for questions. I'm just curious, could you give us any reasons to be optimistic about what's gonna happen in that area? <laughs> yeah, sure, thank you, it's a great question. Um, and yeah, it's part of my, um, um, my work um, as a peace studies scholar is that I look at um, uh, very, very importantly, first try to trace and understand how narrative and, and claims that seems to be uncompromising, claims for non-negotiability, how they come about. So this is a process of hist historicizing, of engaging in critique that kind of denaturalize what seems to be self-evident, presented to us as these are the, the, the facts on the ground. Um, and then, but, th but that's not sufficient. Uh, to retain a sense of hope. The sense of hope for change is to look at how, while there are narratives that, are, that authorize um, all those layers of violence, there are also people, voices, social movements, and articulation of critique uh, that, that are constructive and can reframe um, um, uh, uh, the claim, reframe the, the, the supposed non-negotiability um, of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, so here I, I, I have a slide of, this is kind of the iconic uh, 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 image of, of the Nakba, of the, of, the, of the beginning of the Palestinian catastrophe. But here there is a picture of um, Jewish, um, uh, uh, Jews from Arab descent who came from Arab um, and Muslim countries with the establishment of, of, um, of the Israeli state. Um, and they, they themselves, I mean, the, the story of victimization and, and um, um, uh, who, who, uh, uh, victimization is very complex. It's not either or. And um, so, so what is interesting, and this is part of, of my, my work to think constructively, is how the narrative of the Arab Jews, the Jews who are, who are Arab, and I, I call them Arab Jews on purpose because part of the, of the narrative is to dichotomize Arabs and Jews as if, they are, uh, as if there is no possibility for Arabs to be Jews. Um, and in fact, these people, the Arab Jews, embody that hybridity, that um, uh, hy hybrid identity. And, they, and they, when they came to, to Israel, they were first, um, 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 uh, first had to be cleansed with DDT because they were looked at as dirty. 
um, and, um, uh, and put in, in, in refugee camps, until today, they are very much uh, discriminated. So, so what is interesting and constructive is that some of them recognize the interconnection between their story and, um, and the narrative of Palestinians, dispossession, and so forth, especially when they employ the lens of Orientalism that I, that I talked about. And there are various conversations that happen in relation to this. And there are various other pockets of, of critiques and challenges uh, and conversations that happen, and you can never really lose hope because you really need to, to, to avoid kind of fatalistic attitudes and look at what, what is out there and think about constructively how to bring about change on the level of social movements but also policy, so kind of horizontal and vertical uh, as well. And, and, and those, those voices exist, those voices even during um, uh, the events right now uh, in Gaza within Israel and the Jewish community uh, globally who critique, who say, no, not in my name, um, and uh, let's think of, uh, of let's challenge the narrative of inevitability that it's inevitable to 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 to, um, uh, to bomb Gaza uh, the way that it was bombed. So I, I do want to retain the sense of, um, of of hope and that there are constructive voices on the ground uh, that can be that that uh, they are newsworthy as well as the, the belligerents. David. Image of uh, Pope Francis at the end, uh, very hopeful. Yeah. And um, what can we as Catholics, Catholic Americans, do to encourage our government to maybe invite the spirit of Pope Francis to have a concert that even handed solution to this conflict? Well, I'm Jewish. <laughs> uh, no, but I, I mean, I think it's a very important question, and there are. Um, um, and um, the, 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 the issue, the conflict is not only contained within the geopolitical space of Israel-Palestine, and it's got important um, kind of tentacles and, and, and spaces where, and there are many stake, stakeholders. Um, so, um, so a lot of the, um, the, the contestation and where change will have to happen is both in the, um, uh, um, the, the, um, the portrayal, the images that are used to, uh, to depict what is going on, um, uh, especially to, to enable the articulation of Palestinian, the Palestinian voice within the um, mainstream media and so forth. Um, and there are many um, uh, efforts that are ongoing right now uh, outside of Israel-Palestine, especially in response to a call from Palestinian civil society for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Uh, that, uh, and, and there are different uh, variations of this call. Um, it's not only one, there, uh, there, there, are, um, there, there is a call for boycott of companies that specifically benefit from the occupation of 1967, not Israel as a whole, but there, is also, there are also calls for boycott of the whole. <laughs> um, uh, but, but I do think that there, it's important to examine uh, the, the long history um, of um, the Vatican relationship to, to Jews um, and the relationship to, to Israel. This is an, an important legacy to, to, uh, to contend with. Uh, and it's not always an easy legacy, um, but also think of what, what does it mean as um, Catholic individuals with the kind of principles um, that, that guide your life. What, what does it mean to, to, um, it, to be invested in various ways or forms um, in an occupation if you think that it is uh, um, that, that it violates the very basic rights of, of, of the Palestinian people. So I think that the contrasting those two images is very profound uh, because here uh, the pop uh, is uh, in, uh, in the Western wall is, is engaging the legacy of, of anti-Semitism, which is important to, engage, to, to, to really think about uh, and, and not, and, and not, not uh, kind of cleanse uh, this legacy by virtue of saying, well, uh, Israel is um, um, yeah, Israel commits uh, human rights um, uh, crimes against humanity uh, or, or whatnot. That doesn't cleanse that legacy. Uh, but, but on the other hand, also think of what well, what does it mean to engage uh, substantively from a faith-based um, orientation? So there are, um, just recently. <clears throat> The Presbyterian Church passed um, a bill uh, to divest from um, to divest from companies that ben American companies that benefits from the occupation. So it's not a divestment against Israel. Um, it's a very specific one that is uh, that is guided by kind of an understanding of investment as an ethical uh, act that needs to be consistent with your overall orientation. 
find it a, an extraordinary moving accident that the Pope is photographed here against the, the apartheid wall. And the graffiti refers to the way in which the wall looks like the, the walls of ghetto. Uh, and, and that seems to me to make that image so yeah, it takes really the universal message of the Holocaust, not the particular message of the Holocaust, but the universal message of the Holocaust uh, into account very centrally. I happen to be a Catholic from Jerusalem. Uh, listening to you, it seems to me that you cannot foresee a division of Jerusalem on the basis of. of uh, the national aspiration of its constituents. Uh, Jerusalem is, is, is growing, and growing because the Israelis are building more and more Jewish settlements to the east, to the south, and to the north. Mm -hmm. There are 450,000 Palestinians who are living in Jerusalem right now. Yeah. How can we envision a peace when that population does not want to be part of Israel or ruled by, by Israel? And it seems to me that Israel is want to maintain the grip on those people. So how, 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 what is your vision of, 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 of reconciling that, that conflict in that sense? Um, just to, uh, to make sure that I understand, the question is how to reconcile the, the, the aspiration to be separate. Well, indeed, Jerusalem is very, very segregated. All, yeah, the, oh, yeah, yeah. all the neighborhoods are extremely yeah. segregated. Mm -hmm. So the Jewish, the, 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 if Israel claims that, it has, uh, that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, mm -hmm. How do you reconcile this, those, those segregated communities who do not want to be part of Israel? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, they're, they're, they're significant, 450,000, yeah, not insignificant. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, this is uh, okay. So I, um, this is a very useful map that is put um, uh, that is um, used by an, uh, a very interesting organization in Jerusalem, an Israeli organization uh, called Il Amim, that traces the, again the, the, um, uh, and really uh, highlight the question that I started with, which is where is Jerusalem? Where is the Jerusalem that you are talking about? So uh, as I mentioned, for most of its history, it was this tiny little. Um, square kilometer where it says the old city with the, the yellow, uh, the yellow line, and this is now the Jerusalem, the, the, the Jerusalem that many um, um, uh, Jewish politicians talk about as indivisible. So this whole space, it's major. So um, uh, so what happened is that. Um, uh, what we see here is, is exactly how the patterns of construction of settlements, so in 96, immediately after 1967, the war of 1967, uh, East Jerusalem was annexed and all this, um, and, and, and construction, like this gentleman said, uh, started to expand Jerusalem, the space, the territory of Jerusalem exponentially. It became, all of it became the municipal boundary, and what is happening now that it's basically swallowing and bleeding into the West Bank, it and, and it makes it uh, impossible to think of a contiguous uh, Palestinian state, a viable, ter territorially uh, uh, viable state. Um, and so, so, so what this map highlights is that, uh, first of all, the, um, um, uh, again, the question of where power uh, and various I, I, um, ideological alliances come into the, the production of what seems to be sacred and indivisible. And, and once you, you again, going, going back to the issue of, well, first you engage in denaturalizing what seems to be self-evident and natural. Uh, and once you, you, you get to this phase, then you can think of creative ways of, th of thinking differently of, of the space. I mean, I, I, so, um, so I recognize that I mean, often Jerusalem is not referred to as a settlement, but a whole lot of Jerusalem is a settlement. Uh, from the perspective of um, uh, what happened starting in '67 and forward, so so it be, it begins to touch on the, on on the on the point that that you raised about the uh, uh, the complexity of the city and the the, the ever expanding um, for the, uh, uh, construction of settlement and how the issue of Jerusalem, the very boundaries of Jerusalem, blend and bleed into uh, the West Bank that is referred to again as Judea and Samaria. So by the biblical uh, the name of the biblical topography that erases the um, the indigenous topography. In the ancient Rabbinic law, uh, there is some reference to uh, the, uh, the, the Hebrews were to be respectful and hospitable to the sojourner in their midst. Mm -hmm. 
Jesus, who was a Jew, later picks up on this when he includes the story of Ruth, who was of Moabite descent in this Jewish family of, of Boaz. Uh, you mentioned more recently the groups that refer to themselves as Arab Jews. So historically, there is this allowance for inclusion of the non-Jew, or let's say the non-pure Jew. Uh, and yet that seems to have fallen very much by the wayside. What accounts for the degradation of that attitude of inclusion? Yeah, um, I, I suppose the, the short, uh, I mean, um, I agree with you that, and I, and I mentioned it in, in the presentation, that there are the, um, the competing motifs within the, the, the sources themselves. But of course, Judaism is not only contained within the, um, uh, the Tanakh, the, the Hebrew Bible. It's um, centuries of interpretation. Um, and part of the issue with, um, um, uh, within the context of nationalism uh, is that millennia of Jewish interpretation um, uh, was really, uh, uh, as part of the, ide the nationalist ideology, what we have is a motif of the negation of exile, and with it um, also the traditions of, of learning and um, uh, that, that, that emerge in the context of diasporic context. Um, uh, where the Jews had um, a very different orientation and the, the, the issue of power, political power, wasn't really theorized um, uh, into, uh, into this kind of, uh, of learning. I think that there is an opening to think constructively uh, about theorizing questions of power that is outside of the paradigm of messianism um, or hegemony uh, and so forth. Um, and uh, so, um, so within the context of, um, uh, of Israel, you, you see... Um, more and more kind of um, um, exclusivist, uh, ethno-national, chauvinistic interpretation of Jewish identity uh, that um um, that, uh, on the other hand, you also have counter voices because, for instance, uh, an organization uh, called Rabbis for Human Rights very much uh, operates with uh, this notion of um, inclusivity and uh, uh, prophetic understanding of um, um, uh, well, treating the stranger in the midst with, with respect, of course, they are the strangers <laughs> uh, from the perspective of, uh, uh, of the Palestinians. The, but, uh, but in any case, I mean, those motifs uh, exist, but w uh, the, the way to analyze or respond to the question or begin to respond to the question is really to put it in the context of, of the discourse of nationalism or the, the, the language of nationalism um, that, um, uh, that, that enables kind of uh, um, exclusivist uh, uh, practices. Yeah. It's time for us to stop and certainly didn't expect to find a solution to Jerusalem here today. But in, in the wonderfully complex presentation that, that Professor Omer has given us and her responses to the question, comes up that sense of the voices we don't hear, the ways in which our media gives us single versions of the, of the multiplicity of voices within Israel, within Palestine, within every group that is part of this debate. Thank you very much.